going to be in the book of 1 John today, 1 John 3. I've been seeing like a, a, an uptick in uh, the perverting of the scriptures, namely this book, this book of 1 John. There's a book that's in the New Testament that Satan would love to run its horns through. It would be this book of 1 John. And there's a reason for that. Uh, Psalm 11.3 says that the foundations are destroyed. What can the righteous do? And this book of 1 John is a, is a book of foundations, foundational principles that are not complicated. They're not, they're not hard to understand. They're not uh, some type of uh, in, uh, parable or symbolic or metaphoric type of teachings that are hard to figure out. It's uh, not a book of parables. It's not a book of visions that can easily be twisted into someone's doctrine or someone's, uh, you know, someone's false teachings. But I've been seeing it. I've been seeing it in uh, even comments. Uh, of certain on, on YouTube's, uh, we've been seeing certain comments of using certain verses in the, in the book of First John, and using them in the way that I mean I've I have not really seen it before. Uh, so it's it's kind of it's kind of scary, but this is what Satan does. He attacks the principles of God. Has God said? Has God said? Once he can get people thinking. Uh, you know, and questioning the Word of God and what it really means, well, you know what? He's, he's got a way to really manipulate and, and cause people to fall away from the faith, cause people to slide back, cause people to stumble and fall, and through these manipulations, I believe many, many uh, are, are actually swinging on that wide gate. They're riding that wide gate that leads to destruction especially those that are adhering to it and those that are, that are listening. They have those itching ears of, of, of false teachers. Uh, so this book uh, is, is not a hard book to understand. It carries a principle of identifying and reproving. Identification and reproving. And that's the main part of this book. It's to identify who the real Christians are. It's to identify and expose who are the false Christians. It's not a, it's not a, um, not a hard book to understand. And, and the, what the thing is, is when you start reading the beginning of 1 John, it's discussing those that are actually saying that they have fellowship with God, but they walk in darkness and do not the truth. So there's an identification process going on. The reason for that is because John wants to protect this church. He's given us these simple principles, these simple foundational principles, to understand who is a true believer and who is not. Who is a counterfeit? Who is a tear? Who is a goat? Jesus gave us all these principles, tares, goats, uh, you know, the, the uh, vessels that are going to be separated when they're drawn up onto the shore. Those that are good and those that are bad. Uh, it's, it's, these, these are, these are, this book is identifying these things. Um, so yeah, 1 John 1.8 has long, we've seen this corrupted many times. 1 John 1.8, uh, where it says uh, it's a stronghold verse and they have uh, this verse is used for advocating perpetual sin Christians continually being in a, in a sinful state and of course it, it's refuted and we've refuted that in other videos and we're gonna probably go back to that and because I've mentioned it in other videos and but I've never had a video just on that and I, I just want to start taking single verses because what happens is is these people that are teaching false doctrine in these churches they take one verse and then they twist it 
They don't give three verses before. They don't give three verses after to give you the context of what actually is going on. Does it say, eh, uh, you know, he that says he has no sin lies and what? Does not the truth. And what they're implying is that you always have perpetual sin. But that's been going on for a while. But I'm starting to see uh, uh, even 1 John 3, 6. 1 John 3, 6 I've seen twisted lately. And if we go to there, 1 John 3, 6. It says, Whosoever abideth in him, talking about Jesus, for we abide in Jesus. John's using the same word, abide, as Jesus did. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Okay? So, we're in our Bibles. We're in 1 John 3, 6. And let's break this down. Is this some type of mystery? Is this some type of mystery verse? The word whosoever in the Greek is paj. Paj. It's pronounced pas. And it means individual. It means anyone. It means everyone. Or as many or whosoever. Whosoever. That's what it means. It's a, it's a good translation here. We have a simple translation. There's no mystery behind that. Abideth is that, is that word that we've talked about before in the Greek. It's called meno. Meno. And uh, it's, we talked about it in the vine and the branches with, with Jesus using these, uh, this word, meno, remain. And it means remain. Remain in. Continue in. Stay in. To endure in. Okay? It's, you have to stay in the place where you are. You have to remain in Jesus. That's the way, we, that's the way we're discussing it about John 15 with the vine and the branches. So, we have abideth. And we have him. We know who it's talking about. Jesus. It's referring to Yeshua. So we're referring to him. And it says, sinneth, whosoever abides in him, sinneth, the word is hamartano, which means to miss the mark. It means to sin. It means to transgress. That's what it's, that's what it's talking about. And uh, it, it's, it's talking about not, not, means no, which means no or not, and uh, it's like an affirmative answer. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. They don't sin. They don't sin. So, it's pretty simple. It's not a, not a parable here. It's not metaphorical. It's simply laid out for the Christian to know. John wants us to know this. It's simple, not hard. Uh, not according to some of the uh, scripture twisters out there. It's not, it's, it turns into something that it, <laughs> that it really is not. Uh, they want to take 1 John 3, 6. 1 John 3, 6, we're just doing one verse today, and we're going to go through a little bit to show the context of it, because we don't take one verse and just apply our doctrine to it. No, we get doctrine from the scriptures. Verse John 3, 6, they twist into something that it most certainly is not. And they want to take their doctrine of imputed righteousness, okay, the imputed righteousness of Christ, and impose it upon this scripture. They want to impose it upon it. And they use, they're starting to use other scriptures like this too that are familiar with 1 John 3, 6. Uh, you know, like whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. They, they do it the same way. They apply it the same way. And they oppose it upon the scripture. They take their, their, uh, their imputed righteousness uh, doctrine and they, they ascribe it to this verse. And it goes something like this. When they sin, it's not if they sin, because they're, they're perpetually in sin. These are the same people that take 1 John 1, 8 out of context, and they twist that up to their own destruction. So they're using this verse, and because they're always in a state of sin, and they, they are going to refute you on this because... Uh, how many times have uh, they come up to me? You sin every day. You sin every day. You sin every day. 
Why do they say that? Because they sin every day. Yes. And if they sin every day, well, then you are no different than them. Who are you to say you don't sin? You're in sin for saying that. But there's a reason why they get so mad. Why are they getting so mad? Why are they getting so mad? If, if, if I'm saying I don't sin, and that's sin, leave me alone in my sin. I'm just abiding by your doctrine. It should be normal for you then, right? I'm just sinning. But because it, they know in their conscience that what I'm saying is correct. They know that the scripture is not teaching that. So it uproars them. It uproars them. So it, it, it pricks their conscience. And they try, they try to subdue it. But it goes something like this. God, because they're in perpetual sin, because of 1 John 1.8, when they're, they're in their cons consistent sin, uh, God doesn't see it. God's blinded by it. They walk around like this and they're sinning every day. And God doesn't see them behind that imputed righteousness shield. It's like, I could sin all day and God doesn't see my sin. I'm super sinner. And you know what? You got to really twist hard to. You got to twist really hard to get that out of this scripture. The second part of First John three six. Again, uh, is applied to the unbeliever, not them. Can't apply to them. This is applying to the unbeliever. The second part of uh, John, 1 John 3, 6 applies to the unbeliever who doesn't have the imputed righteousness of Christ protecting them from the wages of sin. Okay? First, the second part says, Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. See, you need the imputed righteousness of Christ. You need the shield in front of you to block the Father's eyes. You need the Christ's righteousness which was traded upon on the cross when he became sin and that's transferred to you and all these other manipulative type of hocus pocus in order for, in order for you to fit your, you know, you've got to fit the, the scripture in here with your doctrine. But according to these false teachers, sin no longer, sin no longer has eternal consequences for them. Only the unbeliever, only an unbeliever who, who, um, who's sinning but doesn't have that imputed righteousness. Whosoever sinneth, that's talking about the unbeliever, has not seen him, neither known him. Okay? Um, but you, again, you've got to really twist. You've got to really twist hard. Uh, their sins have been wiped out. The eternal effect of sin upon them no longer exists. All their sins have been wiped out. Past, present, and future. God doesn't see them. Does the scripture say that? God sees everything. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.26, for if we, if we willfully sin after receiving the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. When you, when you have a mindset of you're in perpetual sin and that when you sin, God doesn't see it, that's a total lie. All these scriptures, all the other scriptures are in vain. All the other scriptures are in vain. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul speaking to the church as an identification. You know, don't be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, uh, the, the, the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, they that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These things are all given for identification and John's doing the same thing. I don't know how they take, they, they, they'll stay away from these other verses. That's what actually happens. They don't want to go there. But again, they've been given a, 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 a license to sin. There's no reason to repent. 
No reason to confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No, there's, there's no reason to do that. One, you, you, you know, they don't need to. The sins have been wiped out. Repentance is unnecessary. And also, if you do that and you stop sinning, well, that's a work. Now you're working for your salvation. All sorts of knots and, and logs get thrown down for... Can you imagine a young believer going through these things? Going, trying to understand all this? When people are just twisting the scriptures. No reason to, to repent, to turn from sin, because they're already forgiven, and they have a front row seat into the kingdom. How? Just by believing. Just by believing. I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus is my Savior. How many people were running to last night? Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Savior. I, I go to church. But there's F words coming out of your mouth. There's F bombs. There's curse words coming out. There's corrupt, corrupt communication. The Bible says in Ephesians, let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth. James 1.26, if any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, that man's faith is in vain and he deceives his own heart. They come and, they, and, they, and, and, and they'll profess that their pastor has the same language. These are scripture twisters. Scripture twisters. So, um, you know, because they say they're not under the law. This is their excuse. They're not under the law anymore. You know, they've been delivered from the law. And, but they're under grace. As Romans 6.15 says. So this, this verse is also used as a, another scripture uh, twisting. In other words, the moral law of God doesn't apply to them no more. Instead of just the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is, it, we're, we're not under the Mosaic law. And that's what it's basically talking about. But the law of morality, the law, of, of the, of what, the law that's written upon your heart, still applies. If we sin, we need to repent. Yeah. I don't care if you, if you name your, uh, you're a Christian. You don't have a license to do that. Amazing. It's amazing what's being twisted out there today. You know, Paul says, let no man deceive you. Let no man deceive you. But because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. And what is he talking about? What things? Sinful things, lasciviousness, foolish talking, jesting, stealing. Let him that st stole steal no more. You read Ephesians 4 through 6, it's giving a list of what you cannot do. And when you walk them again, when you bring them to these verses, well, you know what comes up next? Who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the Bible? Did man write the Bible? Now they're pricked in their heart because they're reading the Word of God. They're hearing the Word of God. But now they want to dismiss it, like it doesn't apply to them. It's amazing. Amazing. Uh, so, yeah. So the law of sin, uh, again, they'll twist Romans 6.15, doesn't apply to them. The law of sin and death no longer exists for them, giving them a license, a license to, to sin. Uh, this is the danger of coming to the Scriptures. When we come to the Scriptures, or a certain sect comes to the Scriptures with preconceived doctrine, okay, they're coming with a preconceived doctrine. They're coming to the Scriptures already with their doctrine. And somehow, somehow i got to get my doctrine into 1 John 3, 6. How do I do that? This is what happens. They take, they take their doctrine and they... Listen, I... It can't mean that, because if it means this, I'm in big trouble. I'm in big trouble with God. Yes. If it means this, I'm not saved. Mm -hmm. But I've been told I'm saved. Everybody in my church tells me I'm saved. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, 1 John 3, 9. How, how does that apply? If that's true, I'm in big trouble. Yeah. I am in big trouble. And fear comes upon them, so they double down to their own destruction. But this is the danger of coming to the Scriptures with a presuppositional mindset of thinking that i got to fit my doctrine into this. Somehow, I couldn't have been taught wrong. Instead of humbling themselves, 
instead of going to the scriptures and looking at the context, which we're going to do, no, they double down. They double down and they get mad because now they're convicted. Now everything they believe. Maybe, maybe they went to college and learned some of these things. You see some of the things that are being taught even on YouTube through college teachers. They're Pensacola type teachers. Man, they twist, they twist, they twist to their own destruction. So somehow you got to fit the scripture into your doctrine and that's dangerous instead of getting the doctrine from the scripture. Uh, scripture twisting antinomians, those that are against the law, doesn't, and the Mosaic law is there, and also the, the moral law, they don't want to adhere to moral law, they've been given the righteousness of Christ, so they're able to, you know, the moral law doesn't really apply to them anymore. And in many situations, uh, they quote one scripture, and what they'll do is they'll not read the context of that, they'll go to another book. You know what I mean? Like I just said, they went to Romans. They went from 1 John, they'll go to Romans to justify that they're not under the law, but they're under grace. And that's how they weave. In. I mean, you could use scripture, okay? You can use a scripture from here, and if you want to go to another verse, that's fine. But you need to get immediate context of what this scripture is talking about through looking at the first, I would say, 10 verses. If it's a questionable scripture, you look at that, he that committed sin is of the devil. Hmm. Do I, do, how do I fit my doctrine into that? No, you need to read. We need to read. We need to read from 3, maybe down to 320 to find out what is actually going on in order to get the truth. But when you're living in sin... It's much easier to take someone's word for it. Much easier to take my, my pastor who's been to, you know, he's been to seminary. He's, he's, he's a pastor for 10 years. I trust him. Can't trust man. Can't trust man, uh, you know, if, if it's going against the scriptures. If it's going against the scriptures, you know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We've got to follow those that are following the truth of the Scriptures. And there's truth to a Scripture. There's truth to it. There's an absolute context to it. So, 1 John 3, 1 through 10, Christians back in John's time and now can easily identify who is truly a brother and a sister. This is why these scriptures were given. Absolutely, this is why many of these verses were written. This was one of the main reasons John is writing to the church here, to protect them from Gnostic-type teachers who were walking in darkness and all the while saying we have fellowship with Jesus. These are the Gnostic teachers here. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Okay? That's who John's dealing with. The teachings and the leftover poisoned from these Gnostic teachers in, in the book of 1 John. Gnosticism was rearing its head back in the, back in the uh, late part of the first century and also into the third century. And there became a big debate with it. It was ruled out. Man has the ability to do what God tells him to do. He has the free will. He's not born, born corrupt and unable to do what God says. That's another subject for another time. But this is the main reason why uh, John is, is writing to this church. Uh, because these people were walking in darkness, teaching that you can, and still have fellowship, one with another and with Jesus. Uh, but no, John says they're lying, and they're, they're doing not the truth. And you know what? This doctrine of the Gnostics is alive and well today. It's alive and well today, and you could see it starting. So you tag these scriptures, which are simplistic uh, uh, teachings, Man, you could, really, you could really do a lot of damage. Walking in darkness, as it says, is committing or continuing on in sin. They haven't repented of it or turned from it. So if you don't, if, if, if John's saying, if you don't haven't repented of it and you're walking in sin, you're a liar. 
You're a liar, and you're not doing the truth. Because they come with this Gnostic mindset. And the Gnostic mindset is that while they're still here in this earthly temple, this fleshly temple, they're in sin. There's no other choice. There's no other choice to, but to be in uh, perpetual sin. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's a, that's a familiar teaching, and it's all over. It's all over the place. But the context, praise God, you know, <laughs> praise God that we have the context of, of what's really going on here. The context is laid out beautifully here for those hungering and searching for righteousness. If you're hungering and searching for righteousness, it's, it's as plain as day. It's not, it's not something that we need to go to college for three or four years to understand. Or we need to go in and sit down and have a talk with the pastor. Because you might, if you're hungering and thirsting in righteousness, you're going to end up probably going in and talking in, in, in with the pastor and understand why are these teachings going on in the church. So, yeah, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And uh, 1 John, we're going to go through 1 John 3, 4. And this is the context. We're going to go through 3, 4 through 10. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the, is the transgression of the law. Or sin is lawlessness. That's what sin is. It's real simple. It's really, really simple. It's not saying certain people... It's not saying those that have the righteousness of Christ, it doesn't apply to them. It's not saying that. It's being opposed into that. It's being pushed on for that. So, I mean, it's, it's very simple. 3 5. And you know that he, speaking of Jesus, was manifested or made known, made known to take away our sins. And in him, speaking of Jesus, is no sin. So if you're, uh, if you're applying to yourself as a Christian, and you're, you're abiding in Christ, to abide in Christ means you're remaining in him, there's no sin. There's no sin in Jesus. We don't continue perpetually in sin. We don't sin continually. It's, it's such a, just a twisted way. So whosoever remains in Jesus does not sin. Not that he's not capable of sinning. We're all capable of sinning. We still maintain free will. We maintain free will. But sin has become exceedingly sinful and loathsome to the believer. Okay? It has become a place where we don't want to go. You know, it's, sin is something that's like mirror in the streets. You know, you, you're walking through somewhere and you see uh, st stuff in the street and you want to avoid it. You don't, you don't want to step in that. You avoid it like the plague. And that's what a believer does because a believer has, has become to understand what it costs Jesus. What it costs Jesus, their love. Jesus should be our love. Would it cost Jesus their love on the cross? The Bible says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. So it's not grievous to keep the, the commandments of God, uh, because we love God. We love God, and we keep His commandments. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, and not do the things which I say? So those that are walking in darkness... Yeah, Lord, I'm yours. Yeah, you're my Lord. You're my Lord. And all the while, they're, they're perpetually living in sin. And Jesus is saying to these people, why are you calling me this thing? You know what a Lord, you know what a Lord means. You're, you're subject to me. I rule over you. You do what I tell you to do. But it's out of love. It's out of love for the believer to Christ. 
So yes, three, three, six, whosoever remains in Jesus does not sin. And sin becomes loathsome to the believer. If he sins, it's possible. It's possible, but it shouldn't be perpetual. It's possible. If he sins, he has an advocate. He has a lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John 2, 1. So the sacrifice remains for a believer in this lifetime, as we're walking in this life, we have a sacrifice because we're not, we're not sinning willfully. If we're sinning willfully, then there remains no more sacrifice for sins. There's a difference. If we sin is way different than when we sin. Or I sin every day. If you're sinning every day, you're trampling the blood of the covenant under your foot. You're trampling it, as Hebrews 10 says. And you're considering it an unclean thing. It's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. So yes, we have an advocate. And then we repent of it. It's not like we take it for granted. I, 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 I sin and all right, forget about it. No, no. We sin, again, we love our Lord. And, we're like, and, and we become broke about it. And we turn from it again. We turn from it. And that, that's, that's the process of... Uh, if, a, if, a, if a believer sins in his life, you know, they, they repent and they get right back on track. They don't let it build up. That should be the process. That's why, that's why when we come together and we... And we uh, we observe the table. We have a time of examination because we don't want to eat with, with sin on our account. You know, we, we need to be clean because it's dangerous. It's dangerous for two reasons. One, it, it killed people back in the first century. Many people were sick in the first century because they were coming to the Lord in sin. There was disputations. There was prejudices within the church. Social, social disorders heresies. And he said, because of these things, many of you are sick and are asleep because they're sinning while all the while taking the Lord's table. So yes, for the believer, we have a sacrifice because we don't sin willfully. We don't sin willfully. So whosoever commits sin has not seen him neither known him. Okay? Whosoever commits sin has not seen him, neither known him. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. 1 John 3, 6. Now, the antinomius doesn't want to apply this to himself. He can't. This has to apply to the, to the unbeliever who doesn't have the righteousness of Christ standing in front of him. That's sin shield. God doesn't see my sin. He only sins the righteousness of Jesus, which is, whew, that's a very dangerous doctrine. So those that commit sin, those who practice sin, those that would classify as some would say, carnal Christians. You ever hear that term? Carnal Christian? Or the carnal Christians that never had repented, that have never been born again. These people have not been born again because there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Paul doesn't call them Christians in the book of Corinthians. He says, are you not carnal? He doesn't call them brother or sister. He says there's disputations, there's heresies, there's this, there's that, there's fornication. He's telling them these people that do these things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So yes, if you're practicing these things, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Because there, if, if you want to apply that to a, a Christian, that Christian never came to the cross in humbleness and with the mindset that he's offended God through his sin. Never came to the cross with a heart that says, Lord, I'm sorry for these things. I'm turning from these things. I know they offend you. They separated me. They're, they're destroying me. Not only destroying me, but they killed my relationship with you. Please, please receive me, Lord. 
I'm turning from these things. I'm turning to your ways. They've never, they've never done that. There's no such thing as carnal Christians. Uh, those that refer to these people as carnal Christians, I would say they're tares. I would say they're tares. They're goats. You know, it's kind of hard to hear the difference between a sheep and a goat sometimes. They can make very familiar sounds. Tares and wheats, they look the same, but they're not. They're born of, of, of a different seed. It's not that good seed. It's a, a incorrupt, it's a corruptible seed. And, you know, Jesus says these will be separated in the end. You know, the angels will come, and they're going to separate those that are, that are right and those that are uh, wrong with God. Those that are unrighteous and those that are righteous with God, they're going to be separated from. And it says they're going to be cast in a furnace of fire. That's serious. That is, I can't get any, I can't put any more emphasis on that because that's enough for me. That's, 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 that's serious business. That's serious business. So getting back to the context, which is very simplistic. John's not making it hard. Uh, 3.7 says, little children, let, na, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So, try saying that. Try saying I'm doing righteousness to someone that believes in imputed righteousness. You know, they're going to blow up. They're going to blow up. They're going to call you every, you're a heretic, you're this, you're that. But what does the scripture say? Is, it, is there something I'm missing here? Little children. He's, not, he's speaking to them as children. He's not making it difficult. It's almost like talking to first graders and the teacher, the master teachers, in for the day doing a seminar. Little children, pay attention. That's what he's saying. Understand. It's not, it's not hard to understand this, little children. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness, or he that does righteousness, is righteous even as he is righteous. Now, I'm not saying that it applies to a Muslim. I'm not saying it applies to certain denominations, that you're working for your salvation. It's talking about doing righteousness through faith, through love in Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. Faith through love, as it says in Galatians 5, 6. Then you are righteous even as Jesus is righteous. That's where our righteousness comes from. Our righteousness comes through what? Faith. 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 That works by love. We love God. We put our faith in God. That's where our righteousness comes. Comes. It doesn't come from the trade-off on the cross. Of course, there's justification, but it's not a sin blocker. It's not something that you're able to walk in darkness with and God doesn't see it. Man, that's a hoax. That's a hoax. So if you're practicing or doing the works of biblical righteousness through faith that works by love, Galatians 5, 6, then you are righteous even as Jesus is righteous. Even as Jesus is righteous. <clears throat> That's because you love God and keep His commandments, like 1 John 5, 3 says. And, you know, what does it say in uh, Ephesians 2, 10? For we are His workmanship. God's working in us. He's our work. We are His workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk or conduct our lives in them. It's natural for a Christian to do works of righteousness because that's Jesus, that's God working in us. 1 John 3.8 We just got done with 3.7 Little children, let no man deceive you. 3.8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, John is giving this, uh, you know, 3-4, uh, th you know, even 3-3, three, 3-4 three, three, through 3-7, three, 
You know, he's giving the identification. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth all the law. Whosoever abideth him sins not. Whosoever sinneth doesn't neither know him or is, uh, has not seen him, neither known him. So he's giving this identification process. And in case, case little children, you haven't gotten it. In case the little children in the church, John is saying, and he's not just speaking to those in the church. This is for us. This is for us. We're, we're part of the universal church of Jesus, part of his body. In case you didn't get 1 John 3, uh, 3, 4 through 6, he's going to repeat it again. We're going to make it simplistic. Okay? We're going to make it real easy. John is going to repeat it again. He that commits sin is of the devil. How do you get around that? How can I get my doctrine into that? Because I'm committing sin, as some of these false teachers and, and false uh, proselytes will say. John said, because he that commits sin is what? Becomes a slave of sin, as Jesus taught. So he that commits sin becomes bound to sin. This is what John was taught by Jesus. Jesus said these words, John 8, 34. He that commits sin becomes a slave to it. And when you become a slave to sin, you become bought of the devil. You're the devil's child now. This is what John's trying to get through them. When a child is raised up in society, they learn quickly, quickly, how to sin. Very quickly. And they become, eventually, enslaved by it. Sin is not normal for the child. You send the child off to, uh, you know, you send them off to uh, a daycare center. Uh, and they enter kindergarten. And, you know, they went out nice and pure that morning. They come home with a new word for you, mommy and daddy. And that word you never taught them. That word was never spoken in the house, but yet they come home with these words. This is how sin has entered into the world. This is how sin is transferred. And children learn quickly how to sin. And because they become enslaved as they grow older in society and they're going to school and they're getting jobs and they're, they're, they're all, all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, they're just mixed in with the world. That's why the Bible tells us not to love the world in 1 John. Not to love the world, nor the things of the world. Because everything that is of the world is not of the Father. It's not of the Father. And because of this enslavement, which, which is the works of the devil, sin is the works of the devil, the Son of God, it says, was manifested. Jesus was made known to destroy the works of the devil. Now, what are the works of the devil? The works of the devil is sin in a person's life. That's why Jesus came to earth, to destroy the works of the devil. This is the purpose. Scriptures, I mean, it's not hard to understand. It's very simple. 3.9 Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Is that a parable? Is that some type of mystery that we're going to see somewhere in the future? Is that some type of, uh, you know, future prophecy? No. Whosoever is born of God. What does it mean to be born of God? It means to be born again of his spirit. Whosoever is born again does not commit sin. They don't just walk into they don't walk in sin. To commit it means you you know you are just you you're practicing it. You're you it just it's just normal for you. Sin should not be normal for the Christian. Again, you can commit sin. You're you're able you're able to. You have the free will to do it. But you're not willfully doing it. And that's what John's talking about. Whosoever is born as God does not walk into sin. They, don't, they just don't sin like, like the rest of the world. There's a difference. There's, there's light now. There's sanctification. You're walking in the light. You're, you put off the old man, which was the body of sin, which was sinful. And you now put on the new man. 
as Ephesians says and other, other scripture says. And you're walking as Jesus walked. For Je John says, he that says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk, so to conduct his life even as Jesus walked. This is the difference. You can't get around these scriptures. There's just too many. Too many. So whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed, which is the word of God, remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Okay? When you're born of God, you're not just going to... Sin's not going to be normal for you. You're not going to say, all right, well, I, I did it. I can do it again. I got away with it. No. Mm -mm. No, you're not, you're not going to say that. You're not going to say that anymore. Anymore. He's born again. This is the context of 1 John 3, 6. You, and you might be wondering why I'm focusing on 1 John 3, 6, because I had someone really trying to justify that through, you know, uh, imputed righteousness. And, I've, and on a boardwalk, I've seen it too. To where, you know, they're referring to God does not see my sin. And that, that is such deception. Such deception. So, uh, the true believer doesn't sin because, he, uh, because he's born of God. He doesn't do it because he's born of God. He or she is born again. It is not because he has the false imputed righteousness standing in front of him like a sin shield and God cannot see it no more. It's not considered sin anymore. Sin is sin. Sin is sin. You know, Paul spoke to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 6. We all know the verses. Ephesians, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 5 talks about all different types of sin. He says uh, all uncleanness and covetousness and, and, and uh, what is it? In covetousness, let it not be named once among you as with saints. You know, so these things aren't supposed to be, uh, you know, someone's not going to, shouldn't be able to say, hey, you know, I, I seen you and, uh, you know, you were, you were doing this and you were doing that, but you're claiming to be a Christian. You know, there's a kid last night telling me he's a Christian and he's fighting me about it. And he, but he's fighting with foul language. I'm like, don't you hear what's coming out of your mouth? You haven't even cleaned that part of your mouth up yet. How long have you been a Christian? I said, you're deceiving yourself. Go to the scriptures. Don't listen to your pastor. Your pastor is deceived and he's deceiving you. Jesus said, Jesus said uh, if, if the blind lead the blind, what happens? They both fall into a ditch. They both fall into a ditch. These people are blind, and they're leading the blind. So it's not because God can no longer see his sin, uh, you know, for the, for the Christian, but because he names the name of Christ. We, we have, the, we have a, a big responsibility, you know. And that responsibility is not something, you know, that we, we're under the shadow of, but no, we, we obey God because we love him. It's motivated by love again. Anything that's not motivated by love or faith is not of God. It's just not of God. Anything that is not of faith, the Bible says, is what? Sin. Sin. So, I mean, through faith, I mean, we can move mountains, Jesus said. We can move mountains. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's because the, the true believer uh, is truly born of God. And he or she is born of the incorruptible seed which is the Word of God. That's the reason why we, we don't commit sin. That's the reason why we don't walk in darkness. That's why, because we don't lie and do not the truth. You know, these scriptures have to be really twisted in order to fit them into certain, their imputed righteousness doctrine. But man, it's going to be a tough day on the day of judgment when they stand before God and Jesus says, Depart from me, for I never knew you ye that work iniquity. You know, these, these, all these scriptures, and I, you know what? You've got to do a lot of dodging and weaving to get around that, you know, to get around these, these scriptures. That's why it's so important, so important to read not one verse, 
but the verses before and the verses afterwards so we can get the context of what's really going on. 1 John 3.10, John gives this simple identifying character traits in order for Christians to know who they are dealing with for obvious reasons. Obvious reasons to know who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. And to beware, to beware, to know who you're yoking up with, to know who's coming into the church. Someone walks through the door and, you know, hi, listen, we met you last night and everything, you know, and uh, they, they want to have fellowship, but yet there's, there's something not right there. They're committing sin. They're, they need to be sat down and talked with because they're not really children of God yet. They need to be explained, the, the true gospel. You know, if, if the, Paul says, if an unbeliever comes in, you know, it's not like it's taboo, you know, but they have to be explained. And, it, and these verses are given to us to know these things, who our true brethren are. So we don't be deceived. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Vain words. So the anvil of judgment, anvil of judgment comes down in verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest, made known, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay, it's not hard to understand what John is trying to have these little children comprehend. He's making it very simple, and he's making it apparent because he's repeating himself over and over again. And that's why they'll only run to one verse. You know, and uh, again, these, and, and we talk about this, and, you know, uh, we'll, we'll say these verses in the open air, but not a lot of people are familiar with this. Not a lot of people are familiar. They'll just hear one verse, especially if they're newly saved, checking out a church. They'll just, they, they're getting fed poison. And that's why messages like this one, which is a simple message, it's not hard to understand because it's not a, it's not a hard message. But they need, to be, they need to be taught. And instead of getting 7,000 views on something, uh, someone coming up trying to hit you or something else, and getting 300 views on a teaching, I'd rather have 7,000 views on this. I'd rather have 7,000 views on this because this is, is meat. This grounds us. This allows us to spread our roots out. When our roots spread out, we're able to grow. That's, that's what I want to happen. And uh, there, are some, there are some good teachers out there that are teaching the same things. Praise God for that. Praise God they were there before even before I, I even understood a lot of these things. Not that I was reading a lot of this, but in the church that I was in, these verses were, weren't read. I never heard the, the book of 1 John 3 ever being preached on. Never. Never heard it. It's there 11 years. I never heard a sermon on 1 John 3. 1 John 1 8, I heard. heard plenty of verse, you know, messages on 1 John 1 8. Because we're in perpetual sin, according to the antinomians. So the anvil of judgment comes down in, in verse 10. And you know what? With this, with, with this, uh, what we have the manifestation of here, the, the judgment which John has given us the conclusion in verse 10, we have to make judgment calls. With this, this, is, this information is given to a Christian in order to make judgment calls. So those that are preaching, judge not. You're, you're wrong. You're judging. You're doing this. You're... It's wrong. It's wrong. It's given to us to be able to make proper judgment. Jesus said, uh, judge not by the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And if we don't judge righteous judgment, we're going to get caught up in their mix. We're going to get caught up in their false doctrine. And then woe to us. Woe to those believers that are, that are drinking poison on a weekly basis. They're drinking poisonous doctrine. Poisonous doctrine. So, yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, 
Those that continue on in sin are what? Children of the devil. Those that continue on in sin are children of the devil. These principles are also laid out for us by Brother Paul in Ephesians 4.25. So it's not just John saying, it's all over the Bible. All over the Bible. Ephesians 4.25 through 5.8. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. What? What would you say, Paul? Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to them in their need. You're no longer stealing. You're not doing it little by little as some will teach. I'm not stealing as much as I used to steal because um, you know, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm, I'm being sanctified uh, gradually. You know? uh, it's, 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 a, it's a gradual sanctification. No, he's saying let him that steal or stole steal no more. But let him, let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may give to him that needeth. He's no longer stealing for a living. No longer doing that. Now he's actually got to get a job. And he's got to help people out. He's got to help people out. And 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of the redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let, he's, Paul's saying the same thing that John says. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with him. There's a strict warning right there. Strict warning. He says, for you were some, sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Children of the light don't walk in sin. They don't commit sin because that's what the children of the devil do. It's real simple, First John. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Let no man deceive us with vain words. Uh, you know, children of the devil... We don't want to become children. Children of the devil are what? As Paul says, children of disobedience. They don't do what God says. They don't do it. The Bible says that Jesus being made perfect became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Not to all them that, that receive Jesus into their heart. Not to all them that go to confession. Not to all them that confess their sins. Not to all them that repent sin. Repent, sin. Repent, sin. No. Oh. All those that obey Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So yeah, uh, I'm going to start doing these smaller messages on just the nonsense that's out there. The nonsense that's out there. Because it just needs to be revealed. It needs to be exposed for what it is. It's poison. It's poison, and if you drink enough poison, it'll kill you. It'll kill you. Put weed killer on a weed or a tree, what does it do? It kills it. And that's what false doctrine is. It's poison. Poison for the believer. Praise the Lord. Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wondered how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean How marvelous, oh how wonderful And my song shall ever be
took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful! And my song shall ever be. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love.